Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast Extra. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Tough Girl Extra is when we go back and catch up with our previous guests. So today I'm absolutely delighted that we're going to be speaking to Laura Kennington. Laura is a British adventure athlete with a passion for the endurance capabilities of the human body. She's a strong believer in the positive impact that adventure and sport can have on children and adults alike. Laura uses her human powered journeys as a platform to inspire and encourage others to get outside. So we initially spoke with Laura back in December 2017 when she came on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about kayaking in Russia, cycling the wild Atlantic way and the circumnavigation of three of the Channel Islands in an extreme triathlon. On today's podcast episode, we're going to be talking more about her most recent challenge, the North Sea Cycle Route, which is the world's longest signposted cycle route, which goes through eight countries, 6,000 kilometers, and the hashtag for the ride was the Great North Ride. Laura is an adventurer and now an author. Woo! <laughs> Congratulations on your new book. So it's called Kairos. Yeah. Tell everybody more about the book. Yeah, thanks. So Kairos is really my journey over the last few years, really. Kairos, the definition of it is basically a certain type of time. The definition of it is the first page in the book because the ancient Greeks had two different types of time. They had Kronos, which is like chronological, and then they had Kairos, which is kind of the right or opportune moment. It's when everything kind of fits together and clicks into place. And when I discovered that word a few years ago it just fit perfectly for adventures I think because you can make your own time and you know we waste a lifetime waiting for the right moment and I think you have to seize the right moment so that's where I got the name from and the book itself covers everything from the last few years from the job I really hated and just tentatively stepping into adventure to well to up to last year so up to now basically so you actually sent me a copy of your book, which is amazing. And I picked it up and I started reading it. And I'm not joking. I was laughing out loud within the first <laughs> couple of pages. And I think, I mean, one of the things that, uh, that stood out for me was uh, it was being back in that office environment. <laughs> and, and that tip that you had, like, just make sure you walk around with a folder. Um, yeah. I did that like that was literally that would be advice that I would give to people because yeah I know if you don't walk around anything people just (laughs) expect think that you're like not busy or not doing anything yeah have a folder walk with purpose and perception is reality yeah I mean (laughs) when you're writing a book and actually having to go back to that period in your life you know back to 2012 back to working that job and 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 almost like reliving like who you were back then yeah it was really nice, actually. I think we all fall into the habit of not really giving ourselves credit for how far we've come. And I can certainly get caught up with kind of, you know, just everyday busyness and am I doing enough and am I achieving the goals that I wanted to for this year? And actually looking back to the days when I was in the office, just hating my life with a fiery passion Monday to Friday actually made me really grateful for the fact that I'm no longer there and that I get to do all the stuff I do now so in many ways it was kind of fun to revisit and kind of cool to look back and be like oh yeah I did I made that change you've created your own your own life you've gone out and you know so in the first episode when we spoke to you we've obviously spoken about the Russian adventure the wild Atlantic way and um, the extreme triathlon around around the Channel Islands Tell us about your your next adventure that you decided to plan. Um, so I think since the last time I caught up with you, I, I ran across Fuerteventura as well. But the, the big one for me was what I called the Great North Ride um, because it was this huge cycle route that's, that hugged the coast of the North Sea, basically. Um, so Great North Ride, North Sea Cycle Route. Um, and it started off in Scotland, the most northerly part of the UK, and it weaved its way, wiggled its way down through the coast of the UK. And then I hopped over to France and basically just wiggled my way up through Europe until I eventually got to Bergen in Norway. So altogether, it was eight countries and 3,700 miles. Oof, that is a big old journey, which is amazing. <laughs> so we're definitely going to be speaking about that. But I just want to take you back um, a little bit before the Great North Ride to, to, to around like the planning, the preparation, how you get ready for challenges like this and where the idea came from, like, you know, that, that initial bit, because I think that's the fascinating bit is everybody has, I think, these dreams and these ideas of what they want to do and what they want to achieve. But actually then doing it, going out, making it happen, that's where I think it's really interesting. So, so yeah, so take us back to where the idea first came from or how it popped up. Um, so I was looking very much for last year in 2018, 2018, I wanted a big challenge. Like I'd, 
I'd been ticking off these smaller challenges and I'd been doing kind of community fitness events and everything was kind of going really well. But I mean, I wanted a challenge I could really sink my teeth into, which is where Great North Ride kind of came into play because I'd, I'd heard about this cycle route, I think a few years ago and just put it on my kind of ideas list of maybe one day or like for inspiration. And I knew it was the right year to do it. I just thought that actually I've got everything I need for a bike challenge. It's reasonably familiar. And I've just Norway has been on my list forever. Like it's such a gorgeous country. Of all the ideas, it it was the one to get me the most excited because there were so many countries and I just thought what a perfect way to spend a few months and what better place to end up in Norway because it's just, you know, the place of legends for adventures. Any images you see of Norway are just breathtaking. Yeah. So once you got the idea, what's the first thing that you do? Like, how do you start planning? Are you, are you, do you are you writing things down on paper? Are you spreadsheets? Are you, yeah. yeah. How does it work um, for you? So I, this is probably going to ruin notions of me as an adventurer. I, I'm a big planner, actually, <laughs> because I like to know how long it's going to take. So the first thing I did was kind of map out what distances I think I could do daily because I needed a time frame. I was I was coordinating talks and community events around it. So it was quite important for me to have a rough route schedule of where I'd be and on what day and what that looked like. So there were countless hours basically putting distances into Google Maps, working that out, where I'd be, putting that all into a spreadsheet, um, which was not very exciting. <laughs> That's a very big spreadsheet. It's not at all adventurous. Um, and really, I mean, that, that I mean, it's year kind of four of adventures for me now. So once I've got that kind of done and I'm taking that over, my next step was really to try and coordinate these community rides that I called them because I wanted to invite people to come out and join me so that was quite a lot of logistical planning as well I was reaching out to local communities local schools kind of saying on Saturday I'll be doing this you can meet me here and you can join me for a leg and that was all something that I really wanted to do for this trip in particular because it was so long to kind of let people be a part of it especially because I was going through the UK obviously my home my home base um yeah so I was really keen to kind of involve other people in that as well so that was a key part of the challenge um and logistics as well how did that go did you manage to meet up with as many groups as you wanted to because I mean one thing that I found uh, well I mean I know it's very very different but on the Appalachian Trail trying to meet up with people (laughs) it it caused me the biggest stresses (laughs) Because like trying to know where exactly where you're going to be and then figure out the might. And I I do know it is different when you're on a bike because you can cover further differences. But yeah, how did you find like the logistics of that? And did yeah, how many people did you get to meet up with? Did you manage to go and do some talks at schools and and all that fun stuff? Um, So I think what I realized quite early on is that for it to not turn into the nightmare, it sounds like you were having where you're kind of juggling stuff around. I set the dates and the meeting points. And I tried to stay really flexible with it. I was like, if you can make it, great, but this is what I'm doing. Um, Rather than kind of coordinate as I went on, because I just knew as soon as I hit the road, I wouldn't have the time to be looking at stuff like that. So I had a lot of heavy organization before I left, which meant that actually once I was on the road, all I needed to do was stick to that plan, uh, which was great. And it it worked pretty well, actually. Um, I did manage to meet up with a few. And actually, it meant that if someone said, oh, I'm, I'm free on this day and you're kind of near, I could tell them where I was going to be at a look at my almighty spreadsheet, which was a lot easier than having to think and work out kind of, you know, what time I could meet them and things like that. I could say, yeah, on this day, I will be here. So please come and find me. Yeah. So you're doing eight countries, 6,000 kilometers. How long were you planning to be away for? How Did you have um, like quite a, a tight time scale? Yeah, I did. So I, I planned it to be two and a half months, which was based on one rest day a week. And that worked pretty well, I would say, up until maybe about the halfway point when I was halfway through and I realized that actually longer challenges, you need a bit more rest. <laughs> So um, I certainly found towards the end of it, I wasn't, my body wasn't really recovering. It went into stress mode, but it's a lesson learned. It was the longest challenge I'd ever done. So I kind of quite naively assumed my one rest day a week would be good. That works really well on kind of shorter challenges, I think, up to about six weeks to a month because you keep the momentum going and that's all great. But I think I probably would have perhaps added in a few more days of rest if I was to plan it again. Yeah. What was the hardest aspect of the challenge for you? Interesting. I think. The terrain was pretty brutal. We had a hideous heat wave, which meant that I was often on the road for like hours in 35 degree heat. You know, farmers were having agricultural 
issues absolutely everywhere. I was running out of water, getting dehydrated from petrol station to petrol station. Like that, that aspect of it was just so much tougher than I thought. And then I think second to that, or maybe even before, you know, coming in before that was actually a bit of loneliness in Europe. I completely underestimated the effect of being by myself for that long um, for the final six weeks and it wasn't that people were any less amazing because obviously people are generally wonderful it's just that limited um, communication skills because of those various language barriers just seem to really exacerbate that sense of loneliness yeah so I did struggle a bit with that towards the end I think also sometimes it gets very tired of um, when you're saying the same story over and over yeah. again <laughs> like where you come yeah. from where you started yeah, how many miles exactly. Yeah, you don't, you don't have such a limited conversation because of the, you know, maybe these are the only things I can say in this language or those are the only things that they can say in English. So, yeah, it does get a bit like that. <laughs> and also when you tell people, when people, you know, will obviously ask you, oh, so what do you do back home? What do you do when you're not cycling? And then you're sort of like, well, actually, I'm an adventurer. And like this, this is this is my life that I've created. Yeah. I, I, I think that people are so fascinated by that. They want to like bombard you with with questions yeah. and some I mean I don't know about you but I would get to the end of a day and just be like I am exhausted I'm mentally and physically I'm just sort of very very done in so yeah let's talk a little bit about about the mental side of the preparation mentally what was it like so you've talked about the loneliness how did you how did you cope when you were out there by yourself um I, I really try to focus my mindset and I do this back home as well and I might have even said this to you before but I have these little kind of habits that I make sure I do every single day especially at the end of the day and it became absolutely vital on the Great North Ride so at the end of every day I would just make myself a list of three things that I could be really happy about and I could be really thankful for even if it had been a hideous day and I finished the day kind of you know sweaty and crying and dehydrated and feeling a bit rubbish I would still make that list and actually I found that I would always have something there would always be three things and actually focusing on that was was completely vital in shifting my mindset and actually we spoke earlier at this podcast saying the office days I would always remind myself just how miserable I was in that office and by comparison even a hideous day on the bike is just so much better than being in that job I hated. When did it all because you know at the beginning of a challenge it's it's awesome it's amazing it's all brand new it, it, it's fantastic when when did it become more of a reality like a day-to-day reality and it was something like oh this is what I'm doing I think the UK section of it was a fairly gentle and lovely introduction like I was back up in Scotland I've spent quite a lot of time in Scotland and it was kind of fun hugging the UK coast or discovering these places that my granddad was telling me uh, sorry my dad was telling me that my granddad helped build the Humber Bridge so I had all these kind of fun little anecdotes as I was peddling through the UK and I think it got real when I headed over to Europe. Like, I think that's when it hit me because I obviously less people were coming out to join me. It was a bit less social. And I distinctly remember getting to Germany and the first day in Germany that like the cycle paths were just instantly horrendous. And I, I, I don't know why it's like you cross the border and then suddenly someone's taken a jackhammer to the road surface. And so I'd been rattling all day on my bike. My brain was kind of shaking in my skull. And I just it suddenly hit me like a ton of bricks because I, I reached this tiny town where they just didn't speak any English. And obviously my German was just horrendous. And I was just like, oh, here we go. <laughs> Can you tell us what it was like day to day? What time were you waking up? What were you eating for breakfast? Were you camping? What was the accommodation like? How many miles were you cycling per day? Yeah, so I would always try and wake up pretty early and get a head start on the day. Um, I, I I quite like routine on the on the road, actually, which is a bit maybe contradictory for an adventurer. But I find when everything else is changing, have a routine. Having a routine really helps me mentally. Um, so I would always wake up about six or seven o'clock. Breakfast was normally lots of porridge, <laughs> peanut butter. Lunch was often peanut butter sandwiches, an awful lot of peanut butter. I couldn't eat it for quite a while when I came home. And accommodation really varied. So I'd wild camp uh, quite a lot to save money. If it was a disgusting day and I really needed kind of a shower or just wanted a bit of reassurance that I'd be able to fill up water bottles and things like that I'd find a local campsite um as well and I'd maybe check into like a hostel once a week for my rest day so my rest days were my guaranteed accommodation days I'd love to talk more about the budget and the costs involved 
what was your budget? How much did you want to spend? Did you get a sponsorship for the ride? You know, how did you, yeah, how did you fund it? How did you pay for it? Um, so life on the road, I find is actually really cheap, especially compared to when I'm back home. And if anyone's got rent costs and things like that, I mean, because I was camping a lot and because I was eating an obscene amounts of peanut butter, it was actually really cheap. And I knew that going into it, um, in terms of funding, I I don't generally get sponsored to do the trips themselves with a couple of exceptions when I've teamed up with the tourism board for a couple of the smaller challenges. But I do get some kit support. Um, I didn't get my bike sponsored. I bought that a few years ago. But I I do get things like a water filter, camping stove, uh, like camping equipment, you know, the tent and things like that. So all of that really helps to bring that budget down as well. So really, I think my main expenses were only things like the ferries. I think I had about 27 different ferries throughout the two and a half months um, and just food, really. Yeah. Do you know how much you spent in total? I don't, I'm afraid. I know I saved up for a few months before and I know I came in a bit under budget. But other than that, I, I don't know the exact figure that I spent, I'm afraid. But I, do, I, I completely agree with you. It's so much cheaper being on the road. Yeah, surprisingly so, I think. Everyone always says, oh, I'd love to do it and I can't save up. And then I go through the, you know, if you go through what people spend in London in a week going out for dinner and things like that, you know, you could pack a good few adventures into that budget. Yeah. And also if you're buying food from, from supermarkets as well and not going out to, to eat in restaurants like, you know, like every evening or having breakfast out at cafes and stuff like that, but you, you, you can definitely do it on... Um, you can do it on the cheap. So yeah. let's go back to the start of the adventure, heading up to Scotland. Tell us, what had you, had you been up? Because it was, I'm going to get confused now. What's the very <laughs> top of Scotland? Uh, out to so Shetland you? Islands. Shetland, sh- thank you, Shetland Islands. That's right. Um, had you been to the Shetland Islands before? Was that your first sort of no, visit No, I hadn't. I hadn't. So that was really, that was lovely. And actually, I distinctly remember getting really excited because I spotted some Shetland ponies and that was <laughs> before then I hadn't really considered that Shetland ponies obviously come from the island of Shetland um so yeah it being at the most northerly part of the UK was great because it was so manic in the run up to it I actually did a lap of the Scottish Highlands I think two weeks before so I did the North Coast 500 route a couple of weeks before as a a pretty sadistic warm-up lap to the challenge um and everything was so busy so actually getting to this lovely idyllic peaceful bit of Scotland at the most northerly part of the UK was was wonderful and then what was it like oh actually do you know what I was gonna say let's just quickly talk about your warm-up ride the NC 500 (laughs) because that is that is not a warm-up ride that's like a whole big ass (laughs) challenge to take on do you just want to explain for people who um maybe aren't familiar with uh with Scotland and the UK what the NC 500 is sure yeah so the North Coast 500 is a lap of the Scottish islands which starts and ends in Inverness uh it's absolutely beautiful it's also horrendously hilly so the story behind this is that I first attempted that ride in 2017 and unfortunately pulled my quad muscle in my left leg so I had a bit of a bone to pick with the NC 500 which is why I wanted to tick it off before I kind of started the Great North Rides and I thought it would be good training anyway so I did a kind of test pack tested out some of the equipment um, and did that two weeks before heading back up to the Shetland Islands. What what was that like? It, you know what it was it was just as hilly as I remember. <laughs> it was it was really amazing actually when I crossed the point where I hurt my leg because I felt like that injury had been over my head for most of that year. I've never had to pull out for an injury before and I'd kind of just been really blasé and thought my body was completely unbreakable. So to be confronted with that failure because I'd hurt my leg and literally could barely walk by the time I came home was really character building. Um, and when I, I think it was day four that I passed that point, it was totally euphoric because I'd been so worried. It's like, oh, I'm going to hurt my leg again. And, oh, what if it happens again? And I fail again, like twice in a row. And the moment that I passed that point and realized that I was going to pull it off, it was just, it just made me so glad that I'd come back to, to face it down. And, the the rest of the days you know seeing that terrain that I didn't get to see the year before was really cool I was really grateful for it oh 100 percent. so yeah so and also what a great thing to do as well in terms of like building your own confidence um I mean how did you find it coming back from injury tough really tough actually um because I think 
you know, you do just get used to stubbornly pushing on. I think you have to have that mindset for so much of what you do on an adventure that you're used to kind of ignoring your body saying that it's tired. And I would say until that point, I've always been able to kind of just, you know, make my body put up with it and get myself through it and just stubbornly kind of persevere. And then reaching a point like that, right? my body just literally wasn't having any of it was it just took me completely by surprise and I didn't really know what to do with it um I mean I'm in a way I'm actually very glad I think it's it did me well to be confronted with it and I think it you know it chilled me out a lot more and actually made me definitely more resilient in the long run but the actual process of having to slow down and rehab and not being able to go out for a run and not being able to go out on my bike and having to go for all these kind of sports therapy sessions I found immensely frustrating because I think you know we're all if you lead an active lifestyle you use it for stress relief as much as anything else so it was a real shift not to be able to go out and do that yeah I mean I think you hit the nail on the head especially with that word frustrating because Mm. I mean my my left knee hasn't been good and it's just and it's it's Mm. annoying me now and it's frustrating and I know there's so many of our listeners who are injured and they're Mm. frustrated and especially and exactly like you said using exercise to help with stress relief and to manage it I mean did you find me one well one thing that I'm struggling with at the moment is almost this um uh, the mind over my body because it's almost like my body's like knows that it's going to be painful if I do this and Mm. so um it doesn't basically I don't want to do it my mind is like no we're not not doing that I think I think injury taught me a really important lesson and that's actually to be kind because I think to to yourself like to myself to be kind to myself because there's a I feel like I just got into this habit of just pushing my body pushing my body and just making it you know it's going to have to deal with it because I'm just stubborn and I'm going ahead with it and actually I don't necessarily think that's always the right thing to do I think sometimes you need to really respect your body and really admire it for the stuff it does put up with but also consider that you know you should look after it as well so actually coming back and having to slow down and having to do a lot more things like yoga was great you know it put the brakes on in it it's made me a much stronger athlete in the long term like I've really reprioritized strength and conditioning going forwards which has helped massively with everything anyway so it was kind of a, a tough thing but definitely a blessing in disguise I think if you can slow down enough to pay attention to what your body is telling you it's really valuable yeah I mean, so you do started in started in the Shetland Islands. You've seen the yeah. Shetland poly, po- poly, <laughs> ponies. You're crossing on the ferries. You're back in Scotland. You've already done like parts of that loop down to um, down to Inverness. You've got all the confidence going. When you're when you're cycling, um, especially we're talking about rehab. Are you doing anything either before you get on the bike or before you get off the, uh, or sorry, or after you get off the bike in terms of just helping your body re- recover from that repetitive motion of cycling? Yeah, definitely. So I take a lacrosse ball with me um, and I dig that into kind of like the trigger point. So that the glutes, it's kind of like a foam roller if anyone's heard of that, but obviously a foam roller is pretty big. Um, so a tennis ball can work as well. And I just kind of roll that and roll that over my muscles. And I was pretty vigilant with doing yoga every night as well. I always found it more important to stretch out than I did in the morning. I'd kind of have a little stretch in the morning, but I'd really notice if I hadn't stretched out and kind of rolled the lacrosse ball around my my like my uh, glutes and stuff the next day. How long were you stretching out for? And do you have like a set routine that you sort of follow? It's probably only about twenty minutes altogether between everything, um, and it's not so much a stre- uh, a routine. Is that I think there's you know I'll see what feels especially tight and I'll know the stretches for those. I've got a background as a personal trainer as well, so that that's come in pretty handy. Um, also pineapple I would try and eat whenever possible because it's really anti-inflammatory and little things like that that I've just picked up over the years to try and help everything oh my god that sounds amazing everybody's going to be <laughs> eating pineapple now and just be like yes it's going to help yeah, you with no, that. it does make a huge difference I, I can't remember I think it's, it begins with B like brome something acid but it's it's uh yeah it's really anti-inflammatory and I do notice a difference when I eat it <laughs> So what was exciting on on um on this trip that you're doing as you're heading down you actually got to go home again which was because you did. you passed home. So was that was that weird when you're out on a challenge to suddenly being going home and then having to leave again? Oh it was 
super weird. So like it was originally, it was a bit of an emotional roller coaster actually. So I was really excited because I started to recognize the roads because I was popping into my mum's. So I, I got to recognize the roads and that was really exciting. And then I got to meet my nephew because he was born the day I left. So that was also really exciting. And I had to cram in all this, all this stuff. And then like 24 hours later, I had to hit the road again. And I was just like, oh, and it kind of just, you know, it hit me all over again. I think like, you know, saying goodbye to your family is, is tough. <laughs> saying goodbye to them twice is, you know, kind of extra tough, especially because by that point, I think I'd done six weeks already on the road. So I, I knew it was going to be tough. You know, the, the original kind of excitement and naivety when you first begin an adventure had, had drifted off a little bit. And I was under no illusions that the next leg was going to be you know, pretty grueling at times. So it was, yeah, it was a real roller coaster of all the emotions. Yeah. What were the sites that you were hoping to see on the way? Did you did you always have things that you wanted to see, whether it was um, p- specific points or um, I was going to say, like for me, it would be like you know, on the on the, when I was cycling down the west coast of America, it was like getting to San Francisco, riding across the Golden Gate Bridge. That was like, oh my god, amazing. For you on on the um, on the Great North Ride, what were those key moments that you had throughout that trip? You know, I didn't, I, th- I know what you mean about San Francisco, it would have been the same. Um, and I was the same when I visited. I, I really love San Francisco and seeing that bridge because it's so iconic was a big moment. But for this trip, I didn't have anything like that. I was excited for all of it because I hadn't been to so many of those countries. And for me, it was much more about the everyday kind of sights by the coast and just getting to know those cultures and getting to, you know, see all of it. Like it was gorgeous and European cycle infrastructure is phenomenal apart from the bit of Germany that I went through but you know Denmark Sweden they really look after their cyclists so that really helps because actually as opposed to the UK you can switch off and enjoy the sites because you're not having to look around for traffic and you know deal with all of that so I it was more just an everyday feeling of contentment and take like drinking it all in absolutely and uh, did you have a tracker so people could follow your journey Yes, I did. Yeah, we had a little online map, which was um, which was created by a guy called Ant at 060. So it was really fun because that means my family back home could follow as well. My nieces and nephews were playing Where is Auntie Laura today? Which is, yeah, <laughs> it always makes me smile. <laughs> did it did it beat your previous map record? I uh, know I don't think anything's gonna <laughs> gonna beat that for viewings. Oh, fair play, that fair still stands. Play. <laughs> so what was it like finishing the trip or well, almost like getting to the end of it end of the trip the you know the final the final 10 days week five days four days what was that like yeah it took me by surprise actually because I'd been wanting to do a big trip for years and this was the biggest one that I'd done and I had this vision in my head I think this really romantic vision of me reaching the end of this epic trip and you know fist bumping the air and feeling just you know like a superhero or just feeling really invigorated and what actually it felt like took me by complete surprise. It was nothing like that. It was just a quiet contentment. And it was so different to how I imagined it. I think by the time I was a week out from Bergen, I was so worn out. Like I was completely exhausted to a level I have never known. Um, and actually just reaching Bergen, I, I was just sat, you know, stood on the bridge of Bergen for like a good half an hour just smiling really peacefully yeah did you feel different after the challenge yeah I did I think I think a lot of it was similar to before but I think actually it just cemented that how much value I think there is in doing it like I felt like I'd put in put to bed a few gremlins from Russia obviously my first solo trip for anyone who didn't listen to the podcast yet is just um my first solo trip was a big disaster, basically, in many ways. And I felt that actually, I'd, you know, by the end of Norway, I'd put all that to bed. And it was this real kind of realisation of how far I'd come. And actually, I, I don't have anything to prove. Um, but yeah, sorry, I'm rambling now. <laughs> no, but it's interesting what you said. When you get to that point where you don't have anything to prove, mm. I think that's so powerful because it does it does happen. It, I mean, it happened yeah. for me. Like It was after the Appalachian Trail. And I was just literally like, I have got nothing to prove to anybody. <laughs> like, yeah, and I think, I think that was interesting. What was so important about my North Coast 500 lap that went a bit wrong is that really – solidified the fact that I'm okay with failure as well like it can I had to confront with it and 
and it was fine. So I think I was already at peace with that side of things before going into the Great North Ride. And I had already made it okay that if anything happened and I have to bail all the rest of it, it would have been fine. And actually knowing that going into something is a very different point to reach the end. Like my, there was nothing to do with ego. It was just something that I really wanted to do and I really felt had value. So reaching the end of it, you know, wasn't this kind of, look at me, I'm so amazing. It was just a kind of gift to myself of something that I've been wanting to to build up to you for a few years. Yeah, 100%. And you did. And it's amazing. <laughs> what was it like coming home, coming back to reality? So this always catches me out. There's, you know, I always think I've gotten away with it. So for the first couple of weeks, I'm just full of joy, you know, not having to scout a place to go for a wee and to sleep in my own <laughs> bed and all the like creature comforts that we always take for granted, like showers, all of those things. So for the first couple of weeks, that's great. And you're catching up with people and it's, you know, it's just really nice to be home. And two weeks after that, it just, you know, reality kind of hits, the emails build up, the admin starts to build up and you start to miss life on the road. So I, I did have a little bit of a slump, which is normal when it happens, but it just took me a bit by surprise yeah. <laughs> every time. <laughs> when did you start writing your book, Kairos? Pretty soon after I came back, actually, that was always going to be the idea. Um, so I, I journaled throughout most of my trips and I've been waiting to write that book for about four years. Um, and I just needed the story to be right, I think. And I think that was the other amazing thing about reaching the end of Norway. It's just like now is definitely the right time. I'm ready to tell this story now. So that's a really good, so just uh, give us some dates then, because that's a really quick turnaround. Yeah. So like, I'm, I'm just doing the mental I math know. in my head. Like, so hold on, when did you finish your bike ride? So I finished July 24th. Um, I came home a couple of days later and I, I think I started writing mid-August. Wow. And then when, yeah. did, when did you get the book public? The book was this year, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So the book was officially ready for publication in June. Wow. Yeah, I kind of locked myself away because I just really wanted to get it done. Um, and I think it was painful in that you have to say no to a lot of other things. But that's like any adventure. You have to prioritize something. You can't say yes to everything. So if something's important, you obviously just have to put that at the top of the list. And unfortunately, by association, that means that some things you have to say no to. And that's what I, I've been doing for the past few months. I've been at my laptop kind of hammering out this book and yeah. <laughs> it's good yeah. to have it out. <laughs> but it's true. There, there is an opportunity cost with everything. If you're saying yes to something, you're saying no to something else. Yeah. I mean, and one of the things that definitely helps me is it just prioritizing what is the most important thing that I have to focus on and get it done. But I think a book as well is one of those things, like the amount of people have been like, oh, I've, you know, I started writing a book and oh, I should really finish it. I've heard so many people say that. And I just think, you know, you could take years to write a book. You could it could remain there just like adventures you know it could be on the someday pile and also it's the perfectionism or wanting it yeah. just to be oh, right that was and such a big thing so I I know it was the end I was like oh I could do this differently and I just got really impatient with it and I was like actually you have to reach a point where it's enough you know it perfect is not the end goal I think I'd love to talk more about sort of day-to-day but can you try and give people like an indication of of what your life is like whether that's a a day-to-day thing or weekly thing how you work is it are you working on one project at a time is it lots of different things like yeah how do you do what you do my biggest income is still talks so that takes up quite a lot of what I do today is a good example um I I've come back recently from a school talk this afternoon we had an award ceremony that's quite common I'll often have a day like that where I'm rushing around to kind of get just out of London to do a talk and then coming back doing admin on the move um if I'm not doing kind of talks there's a couple of brand partnership things that pop up here and now so the weekend before I was with my brand partners Keen who I've been with for a few years and we were doing a campaign in London to try and clean up some of the waterways um and highlight the issues of plastic pollution so there'll be at any time there'll be a few things like that day to day it's a bit different this year because of the book but normally what I try and do is target all my talks for certain months and then I block out a few months in the middle of summer for a challenge I haven't done that this year because I was you know the challenge has been the book so I've been around a lot more which means I've been kind of all over the UK kind of visiting schools and and doing talks and and sorting out things like that really but I'd say that's there is no typical week there is no typical day but yeah talks and kind of brand partnerships are on a ongoing basis really do you enjoy your life 
I absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, today is a really good example. The, the, the school talks that I did, there were these year six kids. Um, so they're like 10 years old. And I just, I was sat there just smiling because it's just, what a wonderful way, what a wonderful thing to do in the afternoon and get, you know, to be a part of that ceremony and to be a part of kind of encouraging young minds to think big. It's a real privilege. I absolutely love it. So, Laura, I'd love to ask you some uh, some quick fire questions. Yeah. Um, so, my questions may be quick, but your answers don't necessarily have to be quick. Okay. okay. Are you a tea or coffee person? Oh, tea. Tea. Ooh, very nice. Morning or evening? Morning. Yeah, I need to switch off in the evenings. <laughs> what time do your alarm go off in the morning? I don't set an alarm, actually. Um, I've gotten a bit better at not doing that because I'm trying to prioritise sleep because things are so busy. But I generally wake up at about 6am anyway. So, Ooh. Can you tell us a bit about your morning routine, what you do and after you wake up? Yeah, so I have a rule about not switching my phone on for the first couple of hours. And I just like to take some time to obviously make breakfast, do all of the things like that, um, listen to something uplifting, like a podcast in the morning. Um, I just make sure that I don't kind of I control the morning basically is how I like to write it so I to put it even so I just make sure that I've set myself up in a good state of mind before I have a look at my emails or anything else that needs to be done what do you do to relax kind of that in reverse really I my phone is on airplane mode usually from about eight thirty at night onwards and I'm not allowed to turn it back on so no screens as well actually I, I don't watch Netflix or anything like that from 8 30 at night and I read every night just to kind of give my brain some time to unwind what, what time do you go to bed ideally at 10 o'clock I like to be in bed for 10 o'clock it's not it's been a little bit all over the place at the moment but yeah 10 p.m is a good bedtime for me now you said you read quite a lot what book are you currently reading at the moment uh, so I'm reading Notes on a Nervous Planet by Matt Haig, which is great. It's very much about kind of some of the topics I've just been saying about how busy life is and how you need to switch off from social media and how fast paced it is and how important it is to put these natural pauses in your in your own life and kind of take back control over your schedule a bit. Now, I think I read in your book that you don't have a TV. Is that still the case? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and do you have a subscription to Netflix? I do have a subscription to Netflix, yeah. Um, I don't watch it that much, I have to say. Um, but for the odd occasion, if I'm really frazzled, it does go on. So what would you be watching? Do you watch, is it movies, TV series, documentaries, or, yeah, what would you watch? Yeah, all of the above, <laughs> depending on mood. I really like documentaries um, and TV series because I can kind of dip in and out. So I prefer kind of just having like a quick 40-minute injection of something rather than three hours of whatever it is so yeah David Attenborough has been on the list recently are you saying then that you don't binge watch I mean I've got to be really tired okay <laughs> yeah like I if I'm completely frazzled and I've been all over the place for talks and all the rest of it there will be the the odd day where I I do do that um but I don't actually find it as relaxing as kind of reading or switching off so I find str screens actually don't tend to relax me that much so if Rather than binge watch something, what I'll do is I'll just leave my phone at home and go for a walk or something like that. I find that that chills me out a bit more. That is so good. I've got to be so careful. If I'm like, I'm going to watch something on Netflix and I pick a series, I'm thinking I'm binge watching. I'm going to yeah, be watching. Yeah, it's addictive. That, but I perp that I, it is totally addictive. But that's why I kind of make myself not do it. <laughs> yeah. Because you just, yeah, it would be so easy to just sit there. So I, and you know, if you do that, you don't get outside because you spend the whole day catching up on the series. So, yeah. True, true. <laughs> what about music? Do you listen to music or do you have uh, any favourite songs? Yeah, I do listen to music. It's just such a mixed bag. So absolutely anything. I, I actually grew up listening to kind of punk music. And these days, it's, uh, it's anything from like Motown to punk to Justin Timberlake. <laughs> you know, anything goes really like ACDC. Yeah. <laughs> I love it I was gonna say I'm just remembering back to your book and your uh, very cheesy playlist that you were yeah, doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit eclectic <laughs> very very eclectic very eclectic what so you mentioned peanut butter but I do, and pineapple but what is your favorite food my favorite food pizza oh pineapple on pizza or not oh yeah absolutely yay high five <laughs> <laughs> yeah big fan of that <laughs> okay just uh two, two more questions what is your favorite bit of kit or favorite bit of gear Oh, interesting. Oh, I really, really love my MSR tent. 
um, my Hubba Hubba MSR tent because it's really lightweight. It's a tie between that and actually the MSR water filter just because it's pretty bulletproof. Both of them just perform brilliantly um, and obviously shelter and hydration are both <laughs> key for survival. So yeah, I think probably the tent because it's really light and it just feels like a palace in there. I was going to say, I just like the name, Hubba Hubba. Yeah, that's also a, a definitely a uh, mark in its favour. <laughs> Amazing. And Laura, do you have a mantra or a motto that you try and live your life by? Mm. It's, not, it's not condensed into a, into a mantra as such, but I want to look back on my life and know that I've squeezed everything out of it. So I will always veer towards saying yes to an opportunity and not let fear of something hold me back. But I don't have a catchy mantra for that. <laughs> In terms of life philosophy, I think it's just make it count. 100%. 100% making it count. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. And so, Laura, I'd love for you to leave our listeners with final words of wisdom, advice, you know, to encourage more women to get out there, to to make life count, to, to go and do great big challenges. What would you say? I think, actually, following on from that question, if I did have a philosophy, it would be take the leap. Um, which is how my book both starts and finishes. It starts with a very literal, dramatic leap of faith. And I think that, you know, we talk a lot about jumping out of your comfort zone and all the rest of it, and it's become a bit cliched, but actually everything good that has happened in my life is because I've taken a leap. And I think it's really important to remember that you are, someone was always a beginner you know, we're all beginners to begin with and we all have to start somewhere and we all have to learn and that's totally fine. So not being experienced or not having done anything that makes you feel brave is not a reason not to do it because we all have to start somewhere. So my my nugget would be to take the leap. Absolutely. And Laura, how can people follow you to be inspired to take that leap? Where's the best place to find you on social media? Um, so on Instagram, I am Laura Kairos. And on Twitter, I am Kairos Laura, and I'm on Facebook as well under Laura Kairos. And people can get your book from Amazon, but they can also get signed copies from your website. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Laura, what I'll do is I'll make sure I put all of the links uh, to your website, to your social media, so people um, can also go and buy uh, the book. It's amazing. I've read it, thoroughly enjoyed it. Honestly, laugh out loud moments. <laughs> Um, Laura, as always, you've been an incredible guest. Thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl Podcast Extra and sharing more about your incredible journey and your life. You provided so many top tips, yeah, nuggets of wisdom. And yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Hey Tribe, it was so fantastic to catch up with Laura. I'm really loving doing the Tough Girl Extra episodes when we go back and speak with previous guests and members of the Tough Girl Tribe. It's just such an awesome way to follow along with their journeys. So everything that we have talked about is available at toughgirlchallenges.com in the show notes, so well worth checking out. Now I've talked about the Tough Girl Tribe before, but the Tough Girl Tribe is the closed Facebook community that I run for the listeners of the Tough Girl Podcast, and it is open for patrons who are supporting at $5 and above. If you come and join the Tough Girl Tribe, you get more access to myself, you get access to a huge amount of what a tribe of women who are supporting and encouraging you as you go after your own adventures and challenges. I have an incredible lady called Alison MacArthur who helps me out and supports the Tough Girl Tribe. And one of the things that she does every Sunday is shares a post about, you know, what have you been up to? And you get to share your triumphs and make your plans for the following week. So just wanted to do a couple of shout outs to the women out there who are absolutely smashing it. I am so proud and it makes me so excited on a Sunday when I, when I read these posts, I'm just like, yes, you are out there living your passions, living your life. So massive well done. So congratulations to Ray Red, who rode in her first league race and won, not by a small amount. They did over three miles in 36 minutes and 36 seconds. Absolutely fantastic. Well done, Ray. I'm so glad that you're getting into the rowing and absolutely loving it. Congratulations to Vicky Hughes, who headed out to the Lake District, getting in quality mountain days for her ML, her mountain leader qualification. She smashed out three days, which is absolutely awesome. Congratulations to Satu, who did a three-hour trail session with 1,250 meters of elevation. And uh, one of the things I love is she wrote, she finally got to listen to some Tough Girl podcast episodes that she'd saved up. So I know quite a few of you do this. You save up your episodes so that you can have a whole bunch to listen to in one go, which is absolutely awesome. So um, yeah, congratulations and well done for signing up for the 360K race in September. 
such an incredible thing to do. I think it's so important having goals to aim for, to strive towards, because then you can put the plan in place. You can start your physical training. You can start your mental training, get your mindset ready. Catherine Knight just got back from leading an awesome team on a sailing expedition to clean up plastic pollution from the high Arctic in Svalbard. The team put in a huge effort, removing a startling amount of trash and were rewarded with some wonderful whale encounters. If you want to learn more about Catherine, you can go and listen to her on the Tough Girl podcast. She shares more about her journey and it's amazing to see how far that she has come along, especially doing all of the sailing in Svalbard. And thank you for your help with plastic pollution. It is so, so important. Danny French, massive congratulations on completing your four day, 100 mile coastal row from Land's End Peninsula to Nos Mayo in Devon. Nearly £4,000 raised. <laughs> I love this. 39 blisters, 10 launches and landings, five big beach cleans. So absolutely amazing. Danny's actually working through a list at the moment of doing 42 challenges before turning 42. She's currently reached 21 or the big row was 21 challenges. And what's really exciting is we're actually going to be speaking with, with Danny French in August for Tough Girl Extra, where I go and catch up with members of the Tough Girl Tribe. And these episodes are good, basically how the Tough Girl podcast has changed your life, what you've learned from it and how you've applied that to your, to your life. So, so these challenges have been inspired by other women that Danny has heard on on the Tough Girl podcast. So we're going to be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. Congratulations to Lisa Kent Sherman, who did her first trail run, 26 kilometers through the stunning Royal National Park. She says she's always been a long distance runner for many years and always run on the road. And she swore she wouldn't do trails, but that's now changed. She totally loved the different feel and challenge of trail running. So a little challenge for you. If you've never done a trail run before, why don't you try running on a trail? Give it a go. Try something new. Or if you've been a trail runner all your life, why don't you try it doesn't sound as good when you say try running on the roads but you know what I mean mix it up try something new try something different see how you feel get outside your comfort zone and give it a go but massive well done Lisa that's a great thing to do big shout out to Damiana Day who's out in New Zealand who is getting back out onto her bike um, and is mixing it up with a bit of road cycling and gravel roads and trails I know you're building up your distances now so just take your time get back into it slowly but just know the Tough Girl Tribe is behind you you're doing an incredible job and I love seeing the photos on Instagram and thank you for representing with the tough girl buff looking absolutely fabulous. So really, really well done. And congratulations to Louise Rothwell, who with uh, with her husband, she went and summited Boundary Peak, the highest peak in Nevada. It was tough and she pushed outside her comfort zone. And tomorrow they're going to be attempting Mount Whitney. So best of luck with that challenge. Absolutely incredible. I love that you're getting out there with your partner and doing what you love. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, keep climbing, keep doing these challenges, keep getting after it. Just want to say a massive thank you to everyone's um, support. So one of the reasons that we're able to put these tough girl extra episodes out is because of the financial support of the patrons and you can sign up at patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast i'm actually having some really exciting talks at the moment with a couple of companies who i really like and really respect about doing some sponsorship for the tough girl extra episodes so i'm keeping my fingers crossed that that will come off because that would just be amazing we're looking at doing well a getting um, the tough girl extra sponsored for a few episodes getting some discount codes for you guys and um and also getting some end of month prizes for the patron prize draw. So that will be really, really exciting. I'll obviously keep you updated. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for all your all your love and all your support. Have an amazing week wherever you are, whatever you are doing. Give it your all. Give it 110%. Get after it. Go for it. And if you're thinking, I can't do that, then I just want you to know I believe you and I'm giving you permission to go after your dreams. Get after it. Have some fun. I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. And we've got loads of bonus content coming out in August to help celebrate the fourth year anniversary of the Tough Girl Podcast. So 4th of August, 2019, the Tough Girl Podcast has been going for four years. There's going to be four special episodes coming out on the 4th of August. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.